Hi, this is Russ Anderson. Today I'm going to talk about rolling shutter and how to exactly determine how much it affects a particular camera or even different modes of the camera. Now rolling shutter is a technical design issue that affects common cameras and produces distortion. Now that is because the camera is reading the image out at the same time it's taking the next image. And in bad cases, it gives you shots that look like they've been taken with a cell phone that suffer very badly from this issue or can have a jello effect. Now, even in small amounts, though, it can be difficult to add new imagery into shots affected by rolling shutter. And that's a problem for match moving. So the only cameras that avoid this problem altogether are ones that have a global shutter or that have a CCD sensor. And CCD sensors are very rare these days. Usually there are CMOS sensors that are very definitely affected by rolling shutter. A common myth is that you can avoid rolling shutter by using a short shutter time. That's not true at all. The rolling shutter is completely unaffected by the shutter time. And some people also say, oh, it's, I'm not going to be doing pans, so that's not going to affect me either. But the rolling shutter problem affects the shot due to any kind of motion, whether it's the camera is moving, whether there's an object in the shot that's moving. Any kind of motion in the shot will be subject to the rolling shutter issue. And so I think that's really a problem for a business that's called the motion picture business. So... The degree of rolling shutter can be described as really just a single value, and you can see that on the Synthize Shot Setup panel down here, where it ranges from zero, that means that there's no rolling shutter, or one, which means that it's really bad, that it takes the entire frame time, you know, if you got a 30 frames per second, it takes a full 30th of a second to read the image out of the sensor. So, Synthize has this value and can use it to compensate the tracking data. And the object of this whole exercise is to determine what the value is for your particular camera. And that's the process we're going to be showing today. And this is just kind of the overview and discussion of it. So what we're starting with is this pan shot, which is going to produce a, a nice strong response. And this process does take a little while, so I'm going to start it up now. And there's a little script called the Rolling Shutter Analysis Script. So I'm going to start that now. And if you don't have that script, you should go and see the website to get that. And there's also a Python setup process that's involved with that. There's a separate tutorial for that. So again, this, this is just a the quick version of this tutorial. And there's a longer version of it as well. It shows the details of what we're doing. But you can see that the script is running away wildly trying out different values of that rolling shutter value to find the uh, one that produces the least error. And this value depends on, on what the camera is, what the model is, what mode the camera is in, and so on. It's a number the manufacturers don't tell you. And they don't really want to admit the problem exists as a whole, I think. The fun part here is that we can accurately determine it. And it's otherwise fairly hard to do it. People have tried to do it kind of by hand, and it really doesn't work out too well. I've tried it. So <laughs> this is a nice, accurate way to do that. As I said, we started with a nice tripod shot panning back and forth. We've got all the points are in the distance so that we don't have any nodal placement errors getting in the way of this. And the shot has features extending all the way from top to bottom of the image. So again, so that we produce a good set of, of data to do the analysis with. And typically that's easiest to do with a long focal length. So you can zoom in on some stuff. You see here the trees in the background. And that long focal length is also good for minimizing the amount of distortion in the lens because you don't want distortion going and mucking this calculation process up. And here, of course, since we are doing the pan, we do want to keep the shutter time fairly short so that we're not too affected by motion blur. 
I think uh, that this is probably uh, maybe 1 640th of a second, say. And we do go back and forth, but not too back and forth so fast that we would lose track. So it's, it just has to be a nice back and forth range. So it's going through, and as you see, it's trying different values, and it's successively homing in on the different values more and more accurately to see what the, the best one is. I'll point out this particular window that we're looking at, this black one, is available only on Windows. Normally, you'd be looking down here in the bottom that gives you the status line of, of what's happening. This is just a little feature I've turned on for the purposes of illustration in this tutorial. So here we go, we're just about done, and ta-da! Now we have this final value, and you can see here we've got both the numeric value and it's also been converted to a time in milliseconds. That's really what's going on underneath in the camera itself. So, you know, that's the value for this particular setting of the camera, and this is a Panasonic GH4 and producing HD images at 30 frames per second. So I've got a little chart here, you know, I've, I've done this a bunch of different times and different shots to get some different values. And you can see what we've got at 30 frames a second at the 96 frames per second rate, and then uh, 4K shots at 24 and 30 frames per second. You can start to, to get some ideas of, as to what's a good idea, what's not. You know, here it would be nice if, if we could get this 9 millisecond number for the 30 frames per second also. Presumably they're, they're doing something a little bad to get to that 9 milliseconds value. Maybe that it's degrading the image a bit. But one of the things that's clearly not a good idea is to shoot it at 4K and then downsample to HD because you're, you're basically doubling the uh, amount of rolling shutter that you're going to subject yourself to. And just to give you an idea of what sort of accuracy and repeatability you get from this process, here you can see a bunch of different different shots that are all basically similar and have run through to determine what this readout time is. And you see they're coming out at this 13.7-ish sort of value for all these different shots. So that gives you an idea. You know, it's a reasonably accurate process for finding out how much rolling shutter there is in a particular camera in a particular mode. Knowing that is, is helpful in helping you compare cameras, see what camera is better than another camera, maybe what mode to use within it. It would be nice in the ideal world to be able to use this to help do our insertions as well. It's possible, but it's more difficult than one would like. You can see some of what goes on here inside of Synthize, even where you can see the differences between the 2D and 3D positions of the trackers you know, are different at the top and the bottom of the shot, even though the RMSR is quite low. And basically that's because the camera view display isn't being corrected, its tracker data isn't being corrected for the rolling shutter. The rolling shutter value is, is used in part of the solving process, but it's fairly difficult to be able to use it all throughout an entire program. So that's a limitation, and you see the same sorts of things now downstream in other applications. You go and export to another application, you know, your Maya or Lightwave or Cinema 4D or whatever, and there you're going to render some new images to composite back, but you, really, to do it right, you need to be able to render images that have the rolling shutter built into them as well. And the only package that I know of that can do that is Lightwave. And to be able to do that, basically, they had to modify their motion blur algorithms to use a different set of images, you know, a different set of times for the top and the bottom of the image. And they, they went and did that. Uh, other software, not not so much. So the bottom line on all this really is that cameras with a global shutter are still the best way to go. You can do this, you can get an idea of 
how badly you're going to be affected by it and how badly things are going to get. But best of all, just to use a camera that avoids it altogether. So thanks for watching.